that were requested that we've not been able to cover yet. Let's stand together and read this chapter in its entirety. Revelation chapter 13. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and on his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Notice didn't say the names were in the book from the foundation of the world. It said the book was in existence from the foundation of the world. And the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. You reap what you sow. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. You reap what you sow. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He spake as a dragon. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth all the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, notice not of the beast, but to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. All right, you can be seated. I want to talk this morning about this uh, Antichrist and the beast, and primarily the mark of the beast. And so many Christians today have questions about these things. Had several uh, come in uh, among our own congregation, and the reason for that is uh, most of your prophetic teachers and your prophetic ministers nowadays uh, take the material from the newspaper instead of the Word of God. And they know the people in their congregations are spending more time with the newspaper than they are with the Bible, and so they're seeking to appeal to them and meet them on their own terms. And they're always seeking to interpret the Word of God in light of today's headlines. I don't believe for one minute Jesus is coming again soon because of anything I read in the newspaper. I believe it because the Apostle Paul said his coming was soon and drawing nigh 2,000 years ago. And if it was nigh, if it was soon 2,000 years ago, how much nearer now than when we first believed. I believe Jesus could come tonight because he said he was coming. I believe he can come today because he said in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. And I don't meet many people nowadays that think Jesus could come today. So I'm not looking at the headlines and interpreting the Bible in light of the headlines. 
I believe the Bible, and if I never look at another newspaper again, and wouldn't hurt me if I did. <laughs> now, here's some problems that we've got to clear up this morning. God helping us, we will. Number one, the beast is not singular. There are two beasts. There is an antichrist, and there is a false prophet. And your prophetic ministers and teachers today lump all of Revelation 13 together, seek to apply it to one person, and that won't work. There isn't any way on the... Listen, I, I know all the Protestant reformers and I know all of your modern day evangelical commentators that stand for the truth of the Word of God. They all point to Rome and say the Pope is the Antichrist. Couldn't possibly be. The Antichrist will be a political leader, not a religious leader. The Antichrist would have to be a Jew to pass off as the Messiah of the nation of Israel. And let me tell you something, folks. I, I don't know how bad things are going to get before Jesus comes again, but it won't get bad enough for a Jew to be crowned Pope. I can assure you that. Now, you never thought you'd see a, a Pole, a communist crowned Pope, like you got right now, but uh, you go, you got a, you, that's a pretty far stretch to think you're ever going to have a, a Jew sitting on the throne in Rome as the Holy Papa. You just, that just won't work. That Jew may be guilty of a lot of things, but he don't bow down and kiss any statues or idols or images. I guarantee you that. One thing you won't find a Jew doing is messing around with all those dollies and everything. So there's a distinction in your Bible between the Antichrist, the political leader, and the false prophet, the religious leader, who brings the political leader to power. Now, if you're going to point to Rome, I'll tell you who you point to. You point to the false prophet who gives the Antichrist his power. Listen, that, that business going on over there in Rome, you watch how those fellows operate. They're never out front. They're never out front with anything. Why, they're, they're running that Nazi party over there during World War II, and you, you wouldn't see a, one of those priests with his SS button on his, on his collar. Not one time. But every one of those concentration camp commandants, Adolf Hitler himself, they had concordance with the Pope, they were trained in Jesuit schools, not one of them was ever excommunicated, and as soon as Eisenhower got to town, they shipped every one of them out through the Catholic churches in South Europe to South America. If you don't believe it, it's all documented on that tape in the catalog on Hitler's Catholic connections. Why weren't they out front? That's not the way they work. They control the people through the confessional booth, and then lift up the political leaders that will do their bidding. That's exactly what they're going to do in the Middle East. In fact, it's probably what they're doing over there right now. So that's the, ses the setup you got. Then secondly, I am so sick and tired of picking up these books and these comic books and commentaries and everything else that show the number 666 on somebody's forehead. God told you that the beast has a name and a mark and a number, and the mark is not the number. Oh, but James, I don't put 666 fertilizer on my garden. That's the Antichrist. Uh, you know, I like that. Oh, I don't use 666 cough medicine. My kid might swallow an unclean spirit. No, that's not your number. That's his number. You've got yours in your wallet. You don't believe it, try and file your tax return without it, or try and get a job without it, or try and draw your uh, uh, unemployment without it, or try and get your Social Security when you retire without it, or try and enroll in school without it, or try and get... You, you've got your number. He's got his, you've got yours. They're going to put 666 on your forehead. They're going to put your own number on your forehead if you're around for it. I said, well, that barcode, that universe. Never mind the barcode. 
Well, I'll show you in a minute. You, listen, see, see, that's what I'm saying. Everybody's looked into the newspaper and then trying to run the... Listen, I've got a book at home showing that the, the Spanish... Uh, the uh, Spanish-American War, 1898, was Armageddon. I've got a book at home showing, showing World War I, 39, incontrovertible proof that this is Armageddon. I've got a book at home about World War II, uh, undeniable proof this is the end of the world and Jesus is coming soon. You know why they didn't write in those books during Vietnam? They'd given up. <laughs> and then old wise and nut comes out with his 88 reasons why I'll be a heretic in 88 and 89 reasons why i would make some more money off the dumb suckers who bought the last book and all that sort of thing, and all every one of those books, Salem Kerbin, I got his notes and his outline, all those books are trying to run the newspaper into the Bible and interpret the Bible in light of the newspaper, and you get fouled up every single time you start trying that kind of stuff. Every time. Now, let's look at this chapter here. First of all, the first beast who is political. In verse number 2, the beast I saw was like unto a leopard. He was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, the Bible doesn't say here that he is he is a leopard, that he's a bear, that he, none of those things. The Bible is giving you some characteristics of this creature. First of all, about that bear, you won't find a Russia anywhere in your Bible. Never mind the Russian bear and all that kind of foolishness. Uh, God, listen, if God wanted to say Russia, he'd have said Russia. What does Egypt mean? It means Egypt. What does Libya mean? It means Libya. What does Ethiopia mean? It means Ethiopia. What does uh, Israel mean? It means Israel. What does Gog mean? It means Gog. What does Magog mean? It means Magog. So, Brother James, I don't see those nations on the map. You didn't see Ghana on the map in 1956. You saw Gold Coast. You didn't see Burkina Faso on the map in 1964. You saw Upper Volta. You didn't see Zaire on the map in 1965. You saw the Congo. Maps can change. Don't change God's word to fit your map because your map will change. A hundred years ago, you had a map with right Russia and Kiev and Ukraine and Slavia, and then you had to throw all that out and say, well, no, that now it's Soviet Union. Now you're having to throw those maps out and get the old ones back out. I'd stick with the Bible. Human governments come and go. God's Word doesn't come and go. So when he says feet like a bear, he simply means slow movement, and, and he can kill you with his hand. That's what a bear does. That hand of a bear is an instrument of death. It's an instrument of cruelty. It's an instrument of power. Now, he talks here about not only that, but he's got a, a mouth like a lion. A lion uses his mouth to tear and to bite and devour. First Peter 5, 8, you're at the story of the devil as a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Where does he get his power? Gets his power from the dragon. What we learned going through Genesis 3 a night or so ago, who's the dragon? That's the devil himself. But now, what is the outstanding characteristic of this beast? He's like unto a leopard. Now, go back in, in your mind and search back through your memory banks and remember that last trip you made to the zoo. And there's something very interesting about a leopard. He is the only creature that on sight you can identify 
He is the only creature that bears in his body the evidence of a perfect mixing of God's three primary markings of humanity. He has a yellow coat, a white belly, and black spots. There is no other creature in God's menagerie that perfectly incorporates the color characteristics of the three primary races of man in one body. So never mind what the newspaper is telling you. Uh, let's see what the Bible says. The Bible says if you want an indication of the system of the beast and the system of the Antichrist, you better wake up and realize that a world that is forcing the amalgamation, the world that is forcing the integration of all races into one, is a world that is prepared for one government, one religion, one ruler, one beast. The black, the yellow, the white, all perfectly integrated. God said he set bounds for the nations. They tried to get together. He scattered them in Genesis chapter number 11 at Babel. He separated them, the Bible said, so they could seek after God. Now they're not seeking God. What are they seeking? They're seeking unity to exalt man. What will be the final end result of that? A perfect unity with the exaltation of what they believe to be the perfect man. It's the leopard system. has nothing to do with racism. has nothing to do with hating people of one color or another. It has to do with looking at the Bible and opening your eyes and realizing as long as you've got separate nations, separate languages, separate peoples, separate races, they can't all get together to crown one king. That's what we're dealing with in our day and age. So what's going on in South Africa? What went on here in the 1960s? What went on over in in uh, France during the, the revolution over there. What, what, what's all that stuff about? I don't know what it's about in the, in the council halls of the governing chambers of our nations, but I'll tell you what it's about among the principalities and powers of the air. It's getting everybody together on equal footing so they can all worship the same beast. Amen. Now, keep that verse in mind. We'll come back there in a minute. Verse number 3, this Antichrist is so perfect in his, in his uh, imitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number 3, I saw one of his heads wounded, one of his heads were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Zechariah chapter 11, speaking of this idol shepherd, speaking of this Antichrist, says he receives a deadly wound by a sword to his head. He's dead. He's killed. And then he's resurrected. Don't you know the whole world would go after one who claimed to be king, who claimed to be their savior, who claimed to be their answer to all the problems and difficulties of the world, if he rose from the dead. Why, they don't know much about the Bible, but they know somewhere in that Bible, they know somewhere in their religious background, they know somewhere in their mythology that no man rises from the dead, and when this man who's received a deadly sword wound rises from the dead, it won't be any problem at all for the religions of this world to worship him and go after him. Amen. Now, I'll tell you something else, too. I thought about this last night, and you can just chew on this a while and pray about it. I've never heard anybody else say this, so maybe uh, so far out in left field that uh, the fastest uh, outfielder in the league couldn't catch it. But I, I have never, I have never rested content with the interpretation that the bruising of the serpent's head of Genesis 3.15 took place at the cross. Because there's no nowhere to cross-reference that. 
in all those teachings in the Bible about the cross work of Christ at Calvary, there's nothing there about bruising the serpent's head. The only place I can find Satan getting knocked in the head is right here in the tribulation time when the Antichrist is slain by a blow to the head. Now, I got running that thing out, and that we get studying Zechariah here, we'll look at it. Uh, I think it's a man from the tribe of Gad that does it. Show us that. No, stick around. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> but uh, there's a there's a wound to the head. Bible says the dragon. Here. Now that's as close as I can find in my Bible to the head of a serpent being bruised. You just have to pray about that thing and and work on it. Now, anyway, in verse four through six, he's worshipped for three and one half years. And then I want to show you something here, just another of the hundreds of reasons why I believe that God's going to get his church out of here. Keep your finger here and look in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And look at this promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 16. And verse number 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There is a promise the Lord Jesus Christ gave, that Satan and the hosts and powers of hell could not overcome or prevail against his church. Now look in Revelation 13 and verse 7. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Whoever this band of saints are that are battling the Antichrist during the Great Tribulation, they are not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be overcome by the gates of hell. This group of saints is overcome, and I'll show you who they are in just a few minutes, and, and uh, we'll talk about them. So, in verses 1 through 7, on down through verse 10, you have some of the uh, the working of his power. You have the beast who is political. This is the Antichrist. Now let's look at the false prophet for a few minutes, starting in verse 11. I beheld another beast uh, coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. Now, notice something about this false prophet. If you're with us when we studied the serpent in Genesis 3, you'll recognize uh, where we're going right away. He looks like Christ, like a Christian, like a Christ one. He has the outward appearance, the actions, the characteristics of a Christ one. Why, if he came to your city and he talked about uh, stopping abortion because of the dignity of the unborn, if he spoke against sexual immorality, if he took a strong stand for the traditional values of the church, you would say he must be a fine Christian man. Amen. Why, if I asked you this morning, I said, man, you hear about all that stuff they're accusing these Catholic priests of and all that immorality and everything else? You know what so many people would say, even evangelical fundamental Christians, they'd say, thank God that at least there's a Pope there that's standing against that stuff. They would. Haven't you heard them say it? Doesn't he get up and decry homosexuality and decry immorality and call the church back to its traditional roots and the faith of the apostolic fathers, why he looks like a lamb. He has all the outward character that the world recognizes as being Christian. And only those that know the Bible and have learned the lesson we learned about Genesis 3 
knows he speaks like the devil himself. Because while what he says is couched in Christian terminology and has a sound of moral righteousness to it, he never speaks with the authority of the Word of God. He always speaks as one who has replaced or supplanted the authority of God's Word with his own authority. That's the false prophet. That's the creature, that's the beast over there at Rome. He looks like a lamb. He has the character of a lamb. But if you listen to what he says, he's got a mouth like a dragon. He talks like the devil. You see that? Now look in verse number 12. Not only that, he exercises all the power (laughs) of the first beast before him and calls it the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceiveth all them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Power! Oh, Mr. Copeland, Mr. Hagen, Mr. Shambach, I hear you fellas talking an awful lot about power. What's the key to that power? We can work wonders that you can see. For example, we can heal bodies. Well, how do you get such a big following? How do you get such a big crowd? By reason of the miracles that we're able to do. You don't read anywhere in your Bible about a great revival in the last days of New Testament Christianity because of miracles. You read about the world being drawn into a false religious system that will crown an antichrist by means of signs, wonders, and miracles wrought by the false prophets. And if you could get people to understand Revelation 13, that passage right there, if you could get saved people to believe that and understand it, it would shut down that mess tomorrow. Isn't that so? You see it? Who's working the wonders? Who's working the miracles? A man who is identified as the beast who puts the Antichrist on the throne. And Christians will stand, put their hands on their hips and look you right in the eye and swear that fellow down there is of God because he can work miracles. Doesn't matter what he believes, doesn't matter what he teaches, doesn't matter how he lives, doesn't matter what kind of reputation he's got. If he works miracles, the whole world will go after him. That's the day and age in which we live. See, I'm not against everybody. I just teach the Bible and and lo and behold we find out the Bible's against all this stuff has nothing to do with me, has nothing to do with our church. This is the book. This is God's Word. Now notice something else. You say, how do you, how do you figure this, this thing, this uh, false prophet is tied in with Rome there? Well, what's the first thing he does? He saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword, and did live. Now, why does he say, to the beast there? Because that rascal will stand up in front of those multitudes, and he'll get on that satellite TV, and he'll say, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. We're not asking you to worship the image. This image points you to our Savior. This image is just an aid to help you worship him. We're not actually asking you to worship the image. This is something we've done unto him. This is for him. This is to aid you and assist you so that you can better worship. Because after all, 
we know that your faith is weak and it's really hard to love a God that's so far away and you can't see. And, and this will help remind you of God. And you know, while it's really not your God, it'll help you feel close to Him even when He's far. You see, that's the Bible. It's not some religion that developed over the centuries. That's in the Bible. And it's not Christianity. It's anti-Christian. Now, once they get you tied in with the aids to worship, then, verse 15, he had power to give life under the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> you, you think they flock to see a statue that sh- sheds tears? You think they flock to see an idol that has blood come out of the palm of its hands? Wait till they find one that talks. You say, how do you really believe people would flock to something like that? Oh, yeah. There are people, you wouldn't believe this, but there are people in America that would pay $35 to see an image of Abraham Lincoln stand up and put his robotic hand in his coat pocket and say, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers came to this nation to get away from the Pope. And, of course, I don't know, I don't remember the tape and all. You laugh about that, but I'm telling the truth, they'll stand in the hot sun in a line for an hour to go in the Hall of Presidents at Dismal World so they can see an image talk. You imagine how long the line would be if they were told, if you don't go see it, we'll kill you? Now, here's another characteristic about this religion that has nothing to do with Christianity and forever sets it as distinct from Christianity. These people make a practice of killing folks that don't believe in worship in their way. You see that? You know any church like that? If you do, you better watch out for it. You better get away from it. Verse 16, now watch. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now, Here's where people get all goofed up. They say, well, Brother James, you know, there's always been an underground economy, and they always will be, and, you know, we'll just be able to, uh, you know, kind of trade and barter and all that kind of stuff. You haven't read Revelation very carefully. You haven't read Genesis very carefully. You ever read about that poison water? All the waters worldwide being poisoned by that wormwood comet that falls from heaven. How many fish you think you're going to catch? You ever read about that fire God sends down from heaven, that drought three and a half years with no rain that destroys the vegetation worldwide? What are you going to have in your little victory garden with no water for three and a half years? You may have all the underground currency you want. You can bury your silver in your backyard and stick your gold up in your attic and keep your coins in your sock, but it won't matter if there's no food to buy. There won't be anything to eat. The only food will be what the Egyptian king gathered into his barns to store before the famine hit. But I go back and read that story of Joseph again. That whole thing is a type and a picture of the nation of Israel, the remnant getting through the tribulation. And the picture there is, the only place you can get anything to eat, they had money! 
They just didn't have anything to buy with the money. And they had to go to Egypt to the king, to Pharaoh, or the money wouldn't do them any good. Well, these survivalists, they get all this stuff stuck, stuck down the basement there and everywhere else. And uh, man, nobody cares about your Krugerrands or your uh, gold nuggets or your copper bars or anything else. If there's no food, there's no food. God said in the book of Revelation, take everything you got to buy a spoonful of dove doo-doo. How about that? There were men in the Old Testament times during famine selling themselves and their family into slavery to get the flesh on a donkey's head to eat. Well, I'm not worried about Brother James. I'm planning for the Great Tribulation. That Gary Larson, he's got some good stuff. Not apart from the Bible, I get more out of Farside and Calvin and uh, Tiger, what's his name, I do anything else. Old Larson got a cartoon, the nuclear bombs are going off outside and these folks are down in this, this cellar and just canned goods stacked to the wall everywhere and the woman's standing there with her hands on her hips and her husband said I thought you brought the can opener <laughs> now now look you're, you're not going to get by you're not going to figure out a way around this thing if God said no buying, no selling, no eating, no living without the mark. God meant it, and you either take the mark, or you starve, or you get your head chopped off. I'd just soon get right with God and get on out of here than be trying to figure out a way to get through it. I think you're a lot better off in the ark than you are with a life jacket trying to get through the flood. <laughs> Amen. Now, let me show you something about this mark. Here's a question. Come to Revelation chapter 7. If you damn your soul by taking the mark, first, or 2 Thessalonians 2, and God's got some people that are going to get through this tribulation time, how are they possibly going to do it unless they damn their soul and take the mark of the beast? That's one of the questions that comes up all the time. I'll show you these people. Look at Revelation 7, verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw the angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Now he's got a, he's got a seal. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed in a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the Jehovah's Witnesses. No, I'm sorry. Of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now what's he got? He's got 144,000, 12,000 male virgins from each of the 12 tribes and before the great and begins God sends an angel down from heaven with a seal to put a mark in their foreheads. Keep your finger in Revelation and turn over to Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter number 9. You ever go through life with your eyes wide open or you just go through life in a big rush and big hurry? What is the mark of a leper? Go over here to Sanford the Zoo. I think they got a leopard over there. It doesn't have 666 written all over it. It's got black spots all over it. Okay? 
So if I'm going to look for a mark of a beast, that's what I'm going to look for. I'm going to look for it in the forehead. And so when I start reading about this religion in Revelation 13, I, I say, you know, I heard some fanatical preacher say that sounds an awful lot like the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I don't really know about that. I wouldn't go that far and be that extreme. And I wouldn't just take his word for it, so I think I'll go down there and check it out. And so I, I'm kind of busy on Sunday. I don't want to miss church on Sunday, you know, and I don't want to miss a, a Wednesday night service, but I've got Wednesday off from work, and before I go to church Wednesday night, I'm just going to swing by the Catholic Church, and you wouldn't believe it. These dear people are lined up, letting a priest take some ashes and put a black spot right in the middle of their forehead and tell them they're worshiping Jesus Christ when they do it. Isn't that a strange thing? Why didn't he mark their cheek with it? Why didn't he sprinkle it on their head? Why does he rub a black spot right in their forehead? Something to it, isn't it? So I go over to, to uh, India and Pakistan and cruise around over in Burma and Thailand and I say, well now you folks, I know you folks aren't tied in with a Catholic church or anything like that. I know you got your own kind of special religion over here. I said, but tell me something. Why do you put that jewel right square in the middle of your forehead? Where do you get that little round jewel? Why do you put it there? Why don't you put it over here on the side? Why don't you put it down here in your chin? Why do you put the thing right in the middle of your forehead? I asked a woman one time, and I, you know, maybe I should not get in trouble for these things. I found out once you don't look a Muslim woman in the eye when you're witnessing to her. It makes her husband mad. And I told her husband, I said, well, if you'd have been speaking for the house instead of her, I'd have looked you in the eye. But he didn't, <laughs> he didn't like that too well. But I asked this fellow, I said, tell me something. I said, over there, I, I've seen, met a lot of your people and talked with them. I said, some of them got a red jewel here, some of them have a blue one, some of them have a green one. I said, well, does that signify, you know, caste or family or something? He said, no, it matches their clothes. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be real deep and spiritual, you know. But why do you put that thing there? And so you say, well, I don't want anything to do with all those old religions. I don't want anything to do with all those things. I want to be part of the new age and get in with what's happening. And so I hide my Bible in the dashboard and I make sure nobody's looking. I sneak out and I go down here to Merlin's Vision. And every book I pick up seems like they got a picture of that fella with the third eye and the pineal gland right in the center of his forehead, receiving enlightenment through a spot just above and between his eyes. This book right here will tell you everything that's going on. Skip the newspapers. Skip the commentaries and the magazines. It's in this book right here. Why don't the New Agers get it through the temples? Why don't they get it through the esophagus? Why do they get it right here in the center of the forehead? Some of you fellas, if you want to go back down some of those bad memory lanes, you could think about those record jackets you used to get, those record albums you used to buy. How many of those things had something to do with light going in through the forehead there? A lot of them, didn't they? An awful lot of them. So when the Nazis and similar folks want to execute a fella, uh, some of them walk around and hit him in the back of the head, but most of them, they put that revolver right there and just splatter his brain, put it right through his forehead. That's a strange thing, isn't it? Where did Goliath receive his mark? Where did the stone smite Goliath? As Louis says, right between the headlines. There's something about that thing. Something about that. Now, Look here in, Revel in Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. This city is Jerusalem. It's about to be destroyed. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, every man with a slaughter weapon in his hand. 
And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. Now, some of you have to hearken back. You've been to the museum. Some of you may be old enough to remember this. But uh, used to have the, on the desk at school, they'd have the little uh, bottle there that the ink went in. You'd have your little fountain pen that you dipped in it. And how'd you fill, you didn't fill the pen, you filled the reservoir, that little ink well, and you filled it from a thing that looked like a cow's horn. And that's what it was. It was an ink horn. You open up the back of it, fill that thing with ink, and then there was a little, uh, little, uh, faucet, a little nozzle or stopper or something in the end of that thing, and you could very slowly drip that ink out of the ink horn into that uh, little um, container there, into that glass bowl. That's what he's talking about here, a writer's ink horn. That's what he had, a horn, literally, full of ink. Now, in verse number three, the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. You want a good study, get your book of Ezekiel and study the glory of the Lord. In progressive chapters, it leaves the holy place and goes to the threshold. It leaves the threshold and goes outside the temple. It leaves the outside of the temple and goes to the gate of the city. The last time Ezekiel sees it, it's departing and going back up to God in heaven. And it's not seen again until Ezekiel 43 when it comes down with Christ to set up the millennium. Uh, it comes down fills that millennial temple. It be a good study for you to run. But he says in verse 3, um, uh, the man, he called to the man, clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Now let me ask you something. All those that have heard the gospel, they're either damned eternally, or they're saved, they're taken out, and you've got here in Jerusalem, to show you how ineffective the gospel witness is in these last days, you can find 144,000 men in Jerusalem alone that have never heard the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a sad day, isn't it? But they're grieving, they're weeping, their hearts are broken for the iniquity, they're seeking God. And this fellow goes around with this writer's ink horn. Let me ask you something. If you've got a writer's ink horn, this little stopper on the end of it, and you put a mark in their forehead, what are you going to have? You're going to have a black spot right in the center of the forehead. Verse 5. The others, to the others he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city, and smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house, and he said unto them, defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth, and they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left that I fell on my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. Behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. So what's he do? Before the wrath of judgment falls on Israel, these witnesses are sealed with a mark in their forehead. It is a black spot 
that as far as any human eye can tell, as far as any human device can detect, is the mark of the beast. Now, look in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32 and verse number 3. Behold, I will pub, or because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Now watch verse 4. For he is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. When Peter stood to preach in Acts chapter 2, he took his passages from the prophetic portions of the Old Testament that dealt with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you know what he said to the men of Israel and Judah? You read Acts 2, he didn't preach the one Gentile one time that whole chapter. He said, ye men of Israel, hearken unto me. Our fathers, and you know what he said? He said, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. This crooked, this perverse generation that has a spot, but it's not like our spot. They have a mark, but it's not like our mark. Now, come to Revelation 14 show you one more thing, and we'll try and tie some of this together. Revelation chapter 14 and verse number 1. Tribulation saints have been taken up to meet the Lord. The Bible says, Revelation 14, 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him on hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, this angel, Revelation 7, comes down before the outpouring of wrath. In the guise of a man, just like the resurrection of Christ, like Manoah's backyard, in the guise of a man, this angel goes through the streets of Jerusalem and he finds those whose heart is faithful and true to God. And he seals them with a mark in their foot. He seals them. The seal of God, the end of that writer's inkhorn, makes a mark that appears to be merely a black spot. For what God Almighty sees is His name, His own name, written in that spot, written in that mark, written in that seat. Now you read a strange thing in your Bible, I believe it's Psalms, correct me if it's not the correct reference, but you read about the head of Leviathan being bruised. And as a result of the bruising of Leviathan's head, Satan himself feeding his people. That sounds like a strange thing, doesn't it? But all the food on the face of the earth is in the coffers of the Antichrist. And nobody can eat and live unless they come to the Antichrist. And here's God's 144,000 witnesses going down to the dispensary every single day 
picking up their tray, going through the cafeteria, getting all the food they want. The girl at the checkout register looks. She sees the black spot in the forehead, never asks any questions. And for the whole course of their ministry, the 144,000 eat the devil's groceries. And feed, feed the devil's commissary while they're out preaching the gospel of the kingdom to get some folks saved during that tribulation time. Now, listen, don't tell me that God isn't in charge, and don't tell me I've got to pick up the newspaper and read tomorrow's headlines and hit the panic button for fear of what might happen. God's got it all worked out ahead of time. And nothing's going to keep him from bringing his purposes to pass. Isn't that something? Yeah, brother? Amen. Psalm 23, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And there they are. Now, say one more uh, thing, and then I'll be through here. All the 666 stuff and everything else, you get excited about it or not get excited about it, that's not what's essential. What we've got to watch out for is an emphasis on unifying religions apart from the Word of God. An emphasis on the miraculous, not the Word of God. An emphasis on persecuting those who will not join your form of worship. Amen. And this mad teaching that the church is bringing in a kingdom. The kingdom that's coming on this earth has nothing to do with the church. It has to do with the Antichrist. And so every so-called Christian group that's going astray from the truth Every one of them is talking about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, get involved in politics, get involved in government, get involved in cleaning up the world, get involved in saving America. Why? So they'll be ready for the Antichrist when he does what they've been trying to do. Folks, I'm getting out of here. Amen. Now, Next time you go to the zoo, <laughs> next time you pick up the newspaper, next time you're talking to somebody that's religious, all these things, see, we, what we need to try and do and learn to do is see everything in light of the Word of God, not the Word of God in light of what we see. We've got to learn to look at things through the Scripture, not look at the Scripture through things make all the difference in, in the world, make all the difference in your life. It really will. Now, I'll say this, I may say it again tonight, it came up the other evening we were visiting. Um, this, is, this is our intent. This is our goal here. Some of you have taught school, and some of you have been through school, and your object in teaching at school is so that when someone graduates 18, 19, 20 years old, they can get a job as a clerk somewhere and they don't have to stop every time and say, now 2 plus 2 is 4, minus 3 is 1. When you've really taught them, those things are instinctive. They become part of their nature. Amen? Daniel mentioned this morning during the song service about going over things and repeating things. Uh, listen, you get caught up in this trap of every time I come to church, i got to hear something I've never heard before. You're going to miss the purpose of assembling together. It's not to hear facts and jot them down. 
it's to be taught, be taught, be taught, be taught until the Christian life becomes our nature, not something we have to think about, until we act in a biblical way instinctively, not as an act of reasoning the thing out and thinking it through. Our purpose is to give you these Bible principles over and over and over and over again, not till they become monotonous, but until they become our nature to perform. That's what it is to be a mature Christian. It's not to be able to research and find some Bible fact. It's to have it become so much a part of you that you act upon it instantly without having to research it. That's what we're after. So these things here, listen, don't just grab the new, take all of them. Take what you hear, pray about it, say, God, make it a part of me so that I live the Christian life. And folks, I tell you, look around this world today with what we've covered here this morning, you better thank God you've got a refuge where you can come to church and fellowship. There aren't many places left that aren't one way or another tied in with this mess right here. In one way or another, they are falling every single week into one form or aspect of this Antichrist system. I'm not saying we're right and everybody else is wrong. I'm saying this book is right, and you, we ought to thank God we can get together and stand on this book. Fellowship of believers that, that love the book and believes it. There aren't many left. There aren't many left. All right, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you told us to rejoice the more as we see the day approaching. You told us, Father, to not let our hearts be troubled, but, Father, to keep our minds stayed upon you. Lord, all of these events, all these affairs that we see taking place in the world round about us, Father, how they ought to encourage us and and call us to remember that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Father, when you come, may we be found watching, may we be found serving, may we be found pure and, and holy as you'd have us to be. Father, we just ask and pray you finish this word in our hearts and lives. Bring us back tonight, Lord, for a great time of blessing and fellowship as we study your word together again. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen.